And now, Dr. Herbert Marcuse. I don't know whether I can handle all these things here. I'm not, I hate talking into the mic rather than to you. So please, if you don't hear me, shout. I would like to uh, give you a survey of the three lectures. In the first tonight, I will try to discuss with you the situation of our society with respect to radical change. And by radical change, I do not mean changes within the society, but change of the society as a whole and its replacement by another form of society. I will furthermore outline very briefly the prospects of the radical opposition and especially try to answer in a preliminary way the question, are there any tendencies objective tendencies affecting the very structure of our society that may lead to its disintegration and therefore provide the soil for the activity, present and future, mostly future of the opposition. Uh, in the second lecture, I will try uh, to discuss uh, what I call the new depth dimension of the opposition, namely the new sensibility, not only new consciousness, but new sensibility, the new type of man and woman uh, which I see emerging, and uh, correspondingly the uh, demand for a new relationship between man and nature and between man and man involved in this opposition. And in the last and third of these lectures, I will deal mainly with the role of the arts, literature, music, to a very minor degree painting, in the development of a radical opposition today. Now, I would like to start by recalling some brute facts. Brute facts uh, which have become so familiar today that they are hardly noticed anymore, but should remain the uh, foundation on which to discuss. That is the fact of the availability of all resources, natural, technical, scientific, that would enable man to abolish scarcity the world over. That means, in face of these resources available to man, the time-honored argument of scarcity, that it is unconquered scarcity which prevents the establishment of a decent society, this argument is becoming entirely irrational. The terrible scarcity still existing in large parts of the world is maintained neither by nature nor because it is in the nature of society to maintain it. It is maintained by the policies, domestic and foreign, of the established societies. Now, in contrast with the availability of all these resources and with the possibility of constructing a decent, free society for all, we see that this possibility is prevented today with all available means. It is prevented in the West by the capitalist system itself because the construction of a free and decent human society could not possibly take place within the framework of the established capitalist system. And it is prevented in the East 
by the competitive coexistence of capitalism and socialism, which uh, has forced the socialist countries or communist countries from the beginning to build up its strategic and technical and military potential at the expense of redirecting technical progress in the direction of integral socialism. Now, this is in the most general traits, the status quo. And against this great status quo, the tendencies and forces which seem to make for a disintegration of the status quo. I at this place enumerate them only very briefly. It is first of all in the metropoles, the rebellion of the radical youth, and the opposition, radical opposition of the racial and national minorities. Secondly, the national liberation movement in the third world, which has long since become part of the so-called living space of capitalism. It is thirdly, the growing economic instability, which now seems to affect the very foundations of the system. And it is lastly, the basic, and I say basic, contradiction between capitalism and communism. Basic because at the present stage, as you see, there is far growing cooperation, if not collusion, between the two systems, the Soviet orbit on the one side and the capitalist on the other. Now the question, and obviously highly a speculative question, which I would like uh, to raise now, is assuming that these conflicts, which I have just outlined, assuming that they explode, assuming that they are no longer manageable within the framework of the established system, what is at stake? Or, what is at stake if there really should be a 20th century or 21st century revolution? I think the first we can say is that this revolution would be the first truly world historical revolution. It could under no circumstances be confined to one country. If it breaks out in the most advanced industrial country in the United States, it would mean the collapse of the lucky regimes which live only by support of the United States in the third world and would thus make room for native, genuine, radical governments finally introducing the long-needed reform. Secondly, this revolution would make possible the independent development of the Cuban and Chinese revolution, which now both suffer from the international competitive coexistence. And thirdly, it is hard to see how such a revolution could be without influence in the Soviet orbit itself. It is most likely that it would lead to a political upheaval in this orbit. Moreover, this entirely hypothetic 20th or 21st century revolution would be qualitatively different from all preceding historical revolutions, inasmuch as it is based on the achievements of industrial society and on the very realistic prospect of finally abolishing man's subordination to the instruments of his labor. That is to say, a revolution which could finally introduce the progressive reduction of alienated labor, 
and could terminate in a total cultural revolution, in one word, integral socialism. Now, the unprecedented scope and depth of this prospective revolution has led the established societies to what I would call already today a preventive counter-revolution. I believe that we have entered the period of the preventive counter-revolution, that is to say a counter-revolution without a preceding revolution, a counter-revolution designed to prevent the outbreak of such a revolution. And this counter-revolution is manifest here by intensified repression at home and continued aggression abroad, by the streamlined organization of the established machinery of government, and this repressive mobilization of the established society is supported by the continued integration, apathy, hostility against radical change on the part of the majority of the population. The so-called silent majority, which in fact is not silent at all, but perhaps the most vociferous majority in history, and a majority which is in its very nature self-perpetuating as conservative majority. I would like to add right here that this conservatism, this hostility to radical change, is a perfectly rational reaction, perfectly rational, because this majority is only too understandably unwilling to sacrifice even the precarious and relative comforts and security they have now for the risk of a total revolution. This conservative majority furnishes the continued support of the established society and, as against it, we find among the radical opposition, divisiveness, confusion, defeatism, and isolation from the masses. This is why I suggested to call for the beginning and for the beginning only this hypothetical revolution, the impossible revolution. Impossible because it seems to have no much and no mass base. It does not seem to express a vital need among the majority of the population. It takes place or would take place in the face of the unimpaired strength and effectiveness of the state machinery. And it would take place at a relatively high level of the standard of living. In other words, none of the classical preconditions for a revolution seem to prevail. And yet, at the same time, this impossible revolution is, in my view, the most necessary of all revolutions, unless our civilization should terminate in a perfect barbarization of humanity. Impossible and necessary revolution. Or, in more technical terms, the subjective conditions for a revolution seem to be absent, whereas the objective conditions prevail. The subjective conditions absent, namely, a lacking consciousness of the incurable 
because inherent conditions of the status quo and of the possibilities for changing the status quo. Now, these subjective factors have themselves become a very material force. As I just mentioned, this lack of consciousness is generated by the system itself, especially by the prevalence of relative prosperity and a high standard of living, and it thus becomes in itself a factor of social cohesion. The conflicts, the misery, the aggressiveness of the existing conditions are hidden behind the technological veil. The system still delivers goods, delivers them rapidly and at an ever enlarging scale, and in the face of this overwhelming power and rationality, the opposition seems to be powerless. Now, the first question I want to try to answer today is, are there any tendencies that might close the gap between the subjective and the objective factors, between consciousness and reality, and thus make the impossible revolution a possible and perhaps even probable revolution. I believe that such tendencies become identifiable if we stop looking for the famous revolutionary subject as if it were a thing, a mass, which is there or which is not there. These tendencies are identifiable if we remember that the revolutionary subject can become such only in the process of change itself, and if we demystify the concept of class and take account of the fact that even the structure of a class changes with basic changes in the productive process itself. This means that concepts elaborate in the analysis of 19th century and early century capitalism cannot simply be applied in the analysis of present-day monopolistic state capitalism. This necessary re-examination of concepts holds also true for the dialectical concepts, provided only that the new concept is not simply the ex post adjustment of the original concept, but is the result of the internal development of the original concept in line with the development of society itself. Now let me try to give a sketch of the social development that in my view compels us to re-examine the basic concepts. To the degree to which the international concentration of economic power progresses and individual capitalist enterprises are increasingly subjected to the interest of capital as a whole, to that degree is capital ever more directly fused with the state? We have the dependence of capital on the political and military power structure, and not only as it is so often maintained the other way around, namely the dependence of the political and military power structure on capital. Domestic and foreign policy are becoming every closer interrelated, Economic and political controls now extend to all spheres and groups of society, 
In other words, we have a centralization of dependence. And, in economic terms, ever more strata of the middle classes become dependent on monopoly capital and are themselves producing surplus value. Or, exploitation in the Marxian sense is universalized beyond the specific class of industrial and agricultural labor. The most familiar trend indicating this development is of course the increasing proportion of white-collar workers, intelligentsia, in the process of material production itself. The emergence <coughs> of the so-called new working class or educated labor necessitated by the increasingly technological and scientific character of the production process itself. But not only is exploitation universalized, it also changes its character. It draws and drains mental rather than physical energy, is human rather than material deprivation, and it proceeds under a high standard of living. Result of these tendencies, the creation of a vast, dependent, underlying population, separated from any control over the means of production, while spending their life in alienated work, but not a proletariat in the classical Marxian sense not in its majority living in misery and abject poverty like the former, in many segments rather bourgeois in its outlook, values and aspirations, and still very different from the ever smaller ruling circles of the bourgeoisie. It can easily be said that Marx never defined the proletariat in terms of its consciousness, but in terms of its situation in the productive process. Apart from the fact that even that situation has changed with the diminishing proportion of blue-collar worker compared with white-collar workers, it is absolutely impermissible to overlook changes in the consciousness especially not for those who want still to be called Marxists, since it was Marx and Engels themselves who said that the consciousness of the exploited class is one of the strongest productive factors. Now underneath this dependent population, which is not a proletariat, the large number of the so-called underprivileged, a euphemism if there ever was one, racial and national minorities, technologically unemployed and unemployable, but at the margin of the regular working class which reproduces the capitalist society. 